What am I going to preach on? Well, the last uh, chorus should give us a key. And uh, it spoke of the promises of God. And that's what I want to speak on this uh, morning. And uh, first of all, I'd like to turn with you to Romans chapter 9. And uh, here is Paul writing concerning uh, the Israelites that uh, they have lost that which God had promised them. And so in verse 4, we see to who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, glory, covenants, giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. Now there are some very wonderful promises in the word of God. And we want to look at them. And in so doing, I want you to become very personalized in the message and say, God, what promises have you made to me? And uh, we should talk about the promises that God has made to Zion, and you're part of Zion, so you inherit these promises. And uh, we're going to do it in three parts. Uh, the first part we'll call salvation, the second, the Holy Spirit, and the third, perfection. All right, we're going to look at uh, the promises of God concerning salvation. And they come through the life of Abraham, who is the father of the faithful and uh, who received the promises. So I just want to start off by looking at Romans chapter 4 and uh, verse 18 to 20. And there we see that uh, he against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall I see be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He believed what God had promised him. And uh, we have to go to uh, Genesis now to find out exactly what God promised Abraham. And it was after his separation from Lot that uh, God spoke afresh to Abraham. And uh, in verse 1 it said, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision. And uh, Abraham said to the Lord God, What will you give me? See, I go childless and steward my house as Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast not given seed, and though one born in my house is mine heir. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And then uh, he brought him forth abroad and said, Now look toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall I see be. And he believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness. So, here we have 
God speaking to Abraham. And uh, Abraham has no children. And yet God said, your seed shall be as the stars in heaven, sand on the seashore. He believed God. Now, the Apostle Paul takes that up, and uh, we're going between Genesis and Romans quite a bit. But uh, in Romans chapter 4, the Apostle Paul takes that and says that Abraham, in verse 21, says he was fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore it was counted to him for righteousness. And here is one of the keys of a righteous man, that he believes what God promises him. Albeit it seems impossible. And uh, verse 23 This ties it up with ourselves. Now this was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him. He was counted righteous because he believed what God said to him. But for us also, to whom righteousness shall be counted, if we believe him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Well, Abraham had to believe that his, star, uh, his seed would be as the stars in heaven above. He was counted righteous because he believed what God said to him. We, on the other hand, have to believe that Jesus died for our sins. And if we believe that, it is counted to us for righteousness. Now then, I want to go back to Genesis 15 and uh, I want you to see that uh, to confirm the promise of God, Abraham was required to take several animals in verse 9 and... uh, taking a heifer of three years, she go to three years, ram of three years, turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. And the birds he divided not. So here we have the beasts, the animals that are cut in two and they're placed opposite one another so it makes a pathway between them and then a deep sleep came upon Abraham now it's interesting this question of the deep sleep I have experienced it and I tell you what it's like You fall into this sleep and it's so dark and you feel as though you're all alone, you're helpless and can do nothing. And anything that's going to be done is going to be done by God and God alone. And in certain times in my life when God was going to do something significantly for me, he would cause a deep sleep to come upon me And I would realize my helplessness. I was not going to be able to experience or to fulfill what God was going to say to me. Well, here it is. The terror of a deep sleep fell upon Abraham and the horror of great darkness. And I tell you, it is just that. And... He speaks to Abraham. And then I want you to see, in verse 17, 
And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. Now, in olden times, this is what they did. They had lambs or sheep or cattle, divided them, and when two people were going to make a shall I say, covenant between each other, they would walk down side by side through the passage of these animals. And that would confirm the covenant. But you see here, Abraham is in a deep sleep. And who are the two people that walk through this passage well, it's a smoking furnace and a burning lamp. And uh, a smoking furnace, of course, in you know, Hebrews 12, uh, 29, our God is as a consuming fire. And then in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12, we find the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ amongst the lampstand. And so we have... The, the thought and the uh, message that this covenant that was going to be made between God and Abraham was going to be assured not by Abraham or by his seed but by God and the Son. And therefore you see what we see today in the Middle East, it seems impossible that, uh, you know, the situation that Israel can hold on and so forth. But in actuality, you see, the land has been promised to Abraham. And the two that are going to see that that comes to pass are the father and the son and not the Israelites. See, it doesn't depend on flesh. And so, you see, when God makes a promise to us, you know, we are kept not by our own strength. My God, I know that. I, I, at night I pant and pant and pant and pant. My heart gets weaker. And I, I think, am I going to see another day sort of thing but what comes to me I am kept by the power of God and it's God who will indeed ensure that the promise that he has made to you shall come to pass not by our own power but by his spirit saith the Lord so th that is something that we must know. Now then, what exactly was the, the promise? Well, in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 10, the Lord has visited Abraham and he says this, and surely Sarah shall have a son. And they were too old and unnatural to have one. But they believed God. Abraham believed God. And the result was, of course, that they had the son. They had the promise. But then, you see, there's something further that is demanded in our lives and we see it in Genesis chapter 22. And uh, Isaac has been born. He's a young boy now. And God said, I want you to take him to Mount Moriah. And I want you to sacrifice him. Well, everything 
that Abraham had been promised depended on Isaac. And yet God said, I want you to sacrifice him. And you know, I have uh, experienced this on occasions, but I, I think of a, a dear Danish missionary. You know, her call was to the Cameroons. And uh, that was her life. She was a nurse, and uh, she had the call of God to go to the Cameroons. And then she came back for a furlough, and she came to us in Switzerland. And she said to me one day, you know, Pastor, God requires that I give up my call, that for which I have worked and lived for these many years, and I'm to give it up. And she wanted me to pray that she would have the grace of God to surrender her call and perhaps remain the rest of her life in Europe. And so we prayed. And then after a few days, her face, you know, shone. And she said, you know what? He's given me back my call. And I think it was only a month or two after that that she was back in the Cameroons. And Werner Canora knows her or knew her because she's since died. But there we are. You see, it's a reality. And that which you have lived and sacrificed for, God might well say, I want you to give it back to me. And you can't count on him doing that which he did for this lady, or which he did for Abraham. Because as Abraham was about to slay Isaac, the angel of the Lord said, stop. And uh, he says that you have not withheld, I, I'm in uh, Genesis 22 and verse 16, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. You see, of course, that only son, Isaac, was a son of promise, and he was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then this follows. Verse 17 that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed. You know, one of the important things is this. What are we going to have multiplied? You know, I was in Australia, and I was uh, speaking in a church of a very prominent Assemblies of God pastor and the Lord spoke to me and he said I am going to multiply them and then the Lord gave me a vision of two apples a good apple and a crab apple and he said I shall multiply what they are well a number of years later, I went back to one of the large churches that had come out of this church, you know, being birthed out of it, and churches were constantly being birthed in Australia from this church. And uh, the Lord said, I want you to go to that church. I want you to look at that church. And... Uh, He said, I want you to read the creed of that church. Then he said to me, it is the crab apple. 
But he said, I said that I would multiply it. So I had the responsibility of having said to them prophetically, you know, this work is going to be multiplied. But you see, what was being multiplied was a crab apple. And if I told you the name of all this, you'd all know it. So there's one thing that's very important. That first of all, our lives must be holy and blameless before the Lord. Because he wants to multiply us. And you go to the mission field, and when I first went to the mission field, I was amazed. You know, on the mission field, you saw exactly what you saw in the United States or England and so forth. The missionary who was Presbyterian produced a Presbyterian church. A Methodist produced a Methodist church. And uh, if there was corruption in the home church, that corruption also came on the mission field. You see, there was a friend of mine. Again, you would know his name, but I don't want to mention names. And uh, God used him in his denomination and several churches were raised up by him and then uh, he was really dissatisfied with his denomination and so he went to another city and uh, sought to raise up a church that wouldn't have the problems of the home denomination as he saw them and uh, nothing happened so uh, a friend said to the Lord what's wrong these other places you bless do you know what the Lord said to him he said you are of that denomination and that is what you can produce and you cannot produce anything else. You think nature teaches us that. You know, an orange tree is only going to produce oranges. With all the goodwill in the world, it will never produce an apple. Potatoes will only pr produce potatoes because God said in Genesis that they were to produce after their kind. That is why it is so important to see the divine order here. In blessing, I will bless you. We want the blessing of God in our lives. We want to be wholly his because as we are, then we will be multiplied. We will be reproduced in the lives of others. You see, we cannot uh, do otherwise. And so this is very important to understand that before we think of multiplication, we've got to realize what is going to be multiplied. And that we want to seek God so that what he multiplies, in other words us, is pleasing in his sight. And so there we have the divine order. In blessing I will bless thee. In multiplying I will multiply thy seed. And then he says two things. As the stars of the heaven... Well, those are the sons of God. And the sand, which is upon the sea. And you will notice in the Old Testament, you see, and then the New Testament too, that there are actually two seeds of Abraham. The earthly, the earthly Israel, 
which speaks of the sand. And then the spiritual ones which speak of the church. You know, I've had the privilege of seeing Abraham. And uh, he was in heaven, and I had this vision of him. Such a jolly grandpa. Had ruddy cheeks, red cheeks. He was bubbling over with joy. And uh, somebody had just arrived from earth. And there was a good old grandpa. He had his arms out. He gave him a tremendous hug and kissed them. And he was so overjoyed to see his seed, the stars coming up. You study carefully the word of God. There are distinct promises to the earthly seed about the inheritance upon earth. And so that uh, this can be established, you know, uh, from the word of God, I'd just like to look with you in Galatians, because it's very important indeed that we are firmly rooted in the word of God when we teach these things. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29, and it said this, If ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So very clearly from Galatians 3.29, that if we are Christians, we belong to Christ, we are also Abraham's seed. And so we are the heirs of the promises of God. Well, it's very important, of course, that uh, we are quality people that God will rejoice in multiplying. And actually, you see, God has given to the fellowship these wonderful promises that he would establish a Bible school, a Zion Bible school in every nation. Praise the Lord. Well, there we are. Now then, I said, uh, you know, basically our salvation is rooted and grounded in the fact that Abraham believed the promise of God. And the promise that we have to believe, of course, is simply this, that Jesus died for our sins. And we've got to be very careful to listen carefully to God. You know, uh, what promises is he making us? And uh, I've received uh, emails from various people around the world coming up with uh, Psalm 91 for me, with long life when I satisfy him. So I, and I believe that. So I'm believing that God will indeed meet with me. And uh, I'm holding to that. And uh, some of these night uh, sessions where the heart seems to almost give out, I say, but I'm standing on the promises of God. Now then, there is another promise that is very important indeed in the word of God and affects us all, and that is the promise of the Father, the promise of the Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of that in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the promise of the Father. What was the promise of the Father? Well, basically it was in Isaiah 43, where God said, I will pour my spirit on thy seed, on thy seed. And uh, the, uh, the Lord Jesus 
links that to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so there we have a clear-cut promise. And I'd like to uh, see the confirmation of that in Acts because it's so important, you know, when you teach and so forth that you relate back to the word of God and uh, Acts chapter 2 and uh, it was where Peter just after the day of Pentecost was asked by you know the uh, believers there in uh, Jerusalem you know what uh, do we have to do And uh, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter said unto them, You have to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And verse 39, For the promise is unto you. This is the promise of the Father the baptism of the Holy Ghost. To your children, to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so, in a very real sense, here's a promise that is very individualized and is open to each and every one of us, specifically to ask the Lord for the fulfillment of of that promise in our lives. And the initial evidence, of course, is speaking in other tongues. And so we must ensure that we do receive that promise, and I trust that we all have received that promise, and uh, it's called the promise of the Father. Now, the thing is this, anybody speaking against that is in real, real trouble because it's called the promise of the Father. And he is the top of all things in the heaven, earth, and below the earth. And highly offended if people do not receive his promise. In fact, you know, I I went to three Bible schools and uh, the first one was kind of a Baptist one and uh, of course I I didn't understand I was very young in the faith in fact I was young and uh, I, I didn't understand why they didn't speak in other tongues and of course uh, I was not slow to make my views known to them. Well, this is what the Lord gave me. In Exodus 23 and verse 2, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. And uh, I understood, you see, that those that were refusing and denying the baptism of the Holy Ghost were doing evil in the sight of God. And that includes a multitude in some denominations. Well, we come now to point number three in our uh, realm of promises and uh, I would like to examine this very carefully with you and uh, to prepare us to understand what Paul will speak on I want to turn with you to Proverbs and uh, Proverbs chapter 16 so that we understand the values that God
places on lives. Chapter 16 and verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. In other words, character is of greater value in the sight of God than mighty works. And so I want to turn with you now to Hebrews 11. Now Hebrews 11 is what we might say the chapter on the uh, heroes of the faith and uh, starts with uh, Abel and it continues through a number of the great men of faith. And uh, then I'd like to look with you in particular to verse 39. After speaking of the works of Abel, Enoch, Noah, and so forth, he said, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise Now, what promise is he speaking on? Well, I want to go back to Hebrews chapter 6. And in Hebrews chapter 6, we have the hope of the Christian. And in verse 19, it speaks of the hope that we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus. In other words, for us, there has been a way made into the Holy of Holies, which was impossible for the Old Testament saints to attain unto. You say, well, what about Moses? Yes, but wait a minute. For Moses, Egypt was the outer court. The wilderness was the holy place. But he did not get into the promised land, which was the holy of holies for him, because his spirit was provoked. His spirit was provoked. And so, for us, and I want to go back now to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 40. God having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect, In other words, perfection was impossible in the Old Testament days. But today we have the possibility of entering into the Holy of Holies. And uh, in chapter 12, I'd just like to look at this little verse with you. In verse 22, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and here it is, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Just men made perfect. And so perfection is being within the veil in the Holy of Holies, which the others could not obtain. But there is the promise of God for us. The promise of being able to enter within the veil into the Holy of Holies. Well... 
I want to conclude with these thoughts. You know, we've said that the title is The Promises of God. We saw Abraham. He had those marvelous promises of having a a heavenly and earthly seed. And that promise in blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. And this is what we want. See, all the promises, if you look into the word of God, are not necessarily fulfilled through the person, but through his seed. I mean, example for myself, when I'm not down in Zimbabwe and Zambia, all I do is lie in bed for about, I don't know how many hours, never sleeping, having a worried Suzette coming in and looking at me throughout the night. Let me see your eyes, because apparently in your eyes you can see whether a person's living or dead. And, uh, sometimes my eyes are more dead than alive. And I said, honey, don't worry. Don't worry. There's nothing we can do. God has to keep me. And then the other part of the day is spent in my armchair, it's quite a nice one with the electronic thing. It goes up and down, up and down. And uh, I don't know what I would do with one that didn't go up and down, up and down. Because it helps the circulation. But that's all I do. If I get emails from Justin about schools and uh, from around the world, here am I... <laughs> You know, more dead than alive and uh, spending hours, hopeless hours in bed, not trying to get, not being able to get to sleep. But through my seed, the purposes of God are being fulfilled. Now, I want you to take these things to heart. So that you have fruit in your old age. And so that by the grace of God, you will have seed who do the work to produce the promises of God that he's made to you in your life. But also, I want you to consider you know, the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, the spiritual gifts, and also umpteen other promises in the Word of God. That in actuality, you know, that we stand on the promises of God. And however extraordinary those promises are, I mean, for me, that I would have long life and so forth. Well, <laughs> you listen to the medical people talking about me and they wonder why I'm still alive. But uh, it's because God has given that promise. And uh, I want you to start asking the Lord, Lord, give me a promise. Lord, what is my inheritance? You know, I, I went to, I was down the uh, tip of uh, Africa, South Africa, and I was looking at a map. This was many years ago. I said, Lord, what uh, nations will we have influence in? And he said, all 50, is about 50 nations in Africa. I thought, my, 
go to India. I'm down in Nagakoil, which is down to the point of India, looking at a map and uh, looking at all the states. And I say, which states, Lord, should we have influence? He said, everyone. Everyone. Then I go to the ca- camera, uh, not the Cameroons, but um, I think we were in uh, Wagga, Wagga do do with uh, Suzette and uh, Pastor Toppy and myself. And uh, we were talking about, you know, the inheritance of Zion in West Africa. And I said to the Lord, you know, what uh, nations are you pleased to give us an inheritance? He said, all the nations of the world. And so, you know, we've got uh, an extraordinary promise. And uh, I'd just like to leave with you uh, this one other scripture. It's Isaiah 51. And uh, here God is speaking to us. He said, hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock when you are, from whence you are hewn, and to the hole of the pit when you are digged. In other words, look where we've come from. And then in verse 2, Look unto Abraham your father, Sarah, that bear you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. And then it says, The Lord shall comfort Zion. He shall comfort all her waste places. He shall make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Well, are we going to believe what God tells us? Or are we going to say, well, that seems impossible. No, I choose to believe God. I believe these are promises that God is giving to us and that uh, when the days of revival come and I receive emails concerning that that people say, oh, it's truly coming. And uh, looking forward to my own healing and I choose to believe that what God says to us is going to come to pass, that we will have an inheritance in every nation and that God will glorify himself through Zion. But what is the all-important thing is what we are. What we are. It's not what we do. Writing all those books aren't going to get me into heaven. No, no. It's the kind of person I am. That's the all important thing. It's the kind of person you are. And that is what you've got to major in. So that you are a person that is pleasing in the sight of God and gives him pleasure. And in so doing, he'll multiply you. Well, God bless you.